I want to get real. I want to get real. Sometimes it's hard to have a conversation about abuse and about emotional abuse in particular. I mean, a lot of times people only really want to talk about certain types of abuse and emotional abuse especially when you are in a toxic situation. I've practiced law for a long time and they talk about no fault divorce and people like fault doesn't matter and all that sort of thing. And first of all, I want to dispel a myth because a lot of times people think, well, no fault divorce means fault never matters. And that's, that is definitely a myth because no fault just means that you don't have to prove fault in order to get a divorce. Like years ago, you had to prove fault in order to get a divorce. No fault means is you just don't have to prove fault in order to get a divorce. Years ago, you had to have certain grounds like abandonment or something like that. Now you just have to say irretrievably broken or, or whatever. But it doesn't mean fault never matters. Fault can come into play. For sure, there are times that fault can come into play. Now, emotional abuse is a little bit more tricky, though, because it is much harder to prove in a divorce situation. And suffice it to say, emotional abuse is certainly abuse, for sure. And there are times that you can weave it into a case, especially if you can look at it in terms of a custody statute or something like that. But, and I, we will make sure that we put the domestic violence hotline below for any of you guys. I want to make sure that all of you guys have access to that number and please make sure you take advantage of using it if you think that you are in an abusive situation, okay? So what, what the domestic violence hotline says is maybe in an emotionally or verbally abusive relationship, if your partner attempts to exert control by, number one, calling you names, insulting you, or constantly criticizing you. So that is emotional abuse. Number one. Number two is acting jealous, possessive, or refusing to trust you. So that is a another way that you can be considered to be in a emotionally or verbally abusive relationship. Okay. Especially if somebody is constantly accusing you of doing things just for no reason whatsoever. And I, I mean, I remember one time I had this client, she almost literally looked like a nun. She was this older woman who would wear these cardigan sweaters, like buttoned up to her neck and she had this short gray hair and she would not wear any makeup. And her husband was this Middle Eastern physician who had been very, very successful, but she was so sweet and prim and proper. Literally, if she just, you know, spoke to another male because the other male would say hello to her in an elevator or something, he would accuse her of having an affair with this other male. I mean, he, he was so paranoid and so ridiculously, insanely jealous. That was so emotionally abusive. So acting jealous like that in a way that's just not rational, not rational can be very, very emotionally abusive to you. Okay. The next one is isolating you from family or friends or other people in your life. You're not allowed to make phone calls at a certain time, or you're not allowed to go see people at a certain time. I remember knowing somebody one time where the husband would actually take note of how many miles were on the car and wouldn't let her drive. You know, that that's so emotionally abusive. That's the next one. The next one is monitoring your activities with or without your knowledge, including demanding to know where you go, who are you in contact with, how you spend your time, constantly monitoring you, you know, putting a GPS on your car, things like that. Why do they need to do that? 
constantly controlling you, knowing where you are. The next one, attempting to control what you wear, including clothes, makeup, or hairstyles. I remember having a client one time where she had been married to a malignant narcissist. And she talked about when they finally got back together, she had left him. And then when she got back together with him and she thought he had changed and they were going to therapy and they were getting ready to go to dinner one night and under her breath, he said something about, oh, lipstick made a comment about the fact that she was wearing lipstick. Like that was so bad. The fact that she was wearing lipstick at all, somehow she was supposed to feel like bad about that in some way. Like she was some sort of, you know, slut or something. The fact that she had lipstick on, that's another one. The next one is humiliating you in any way, especially in front of others. You know, just horrible. Any kind of humiliation in front of others is bad. Nothing more needs to be even said about that. Next one is gaslighting you by pretending not to understand or refusing to listen to you, questioning your recollection of facts, events, or sources, trivializing your need if you have feelings or denying your previous statements. Anytime somebody says, you know, if you feel like you have needs and you're saying, you know, this is the way you feel. And they say, that's not the way you feel. Or if they're saying, you know, that's ridiculous, or that's not what you're seeing, or anytime somebody is making you feel like you're crazy, that's gaslighting, refusing to listen to you. That's gaslighting, making jokes about you that are hurtful. And then saying that you can't take a joke. You're butt is fat or whatever. Oh, you can't take a joke. Those kinds of things are hurtful. You know, you see a text message exchange between your significant other and somebody of the opposite sex, and it it looks suggestive and you ask them about it and, and they say, oh, you know, you're reading too much into it. You're probably not that sort of thing. So that's gaslighting. Next one is threatening you, your children, your family, or your pets with or without weapons, any kind of threatening, you know, if you do this, this is going to happen. You better stop it where you feel in fear, you're worried for your safety, you're worried that something's going to happen. Never okay. Absolutely never okay. Damaging your belongings, including throwing objects, punching walls, kicking doors, never okay. If your property gets destroyed, things get broken, that's just absolutely never okay. Blaming you for abusive behavior, again, never okay. You know, I go back to Maya Angelou quote, which was always so perfect when people show you who they are, believe them the first time. Okay. And then when they try to say they're sorry, you know, it's like that narcissist faux apology. It's probably a bunch of crap. And I have a whole video on what narcissists really mean when they say they're sorry. And you can definitely check that out. Probably sorry, not sorry. Don't believe them you know, stand in your power. And, you know, you can put that in the comments. I stand in my power. Put that in the comments right now. I stand in my power. Okay. Next one is accusing you of cheating or cheating themselves and blaming you for their actions. You know, that projection and deflection or lying and denying always narc moves. All right. Or cheating to intentionally hurt you and then threatening to cheat again to suggest they're better than you. They're always going after better forms of supply. You know that, right? You let you know that they can get their better forms of supply to try to put you in your place. And then the last one is telling you that you're so lucky to be with them. And I have a whole video, by the way, on Narcissus' favorite catchphrases, which you can definitely check out. That's, you know, one of the things that they'll say, like, you're so lucky to be with me. You know, when they say stuff like that, it's just so ridiculous. Don't believe 
things like that. You'll never find somebody else as good as me. You'll never find anybody else who loves you as much as me. Those are phrases designed to try to control you. Okay. Those are all things to try to manipulate you, destabilize you, to keep you under their thumb because they have no sense of self. And so they're trying to keep you in their power. All right. So those are all signs of emotional abuse. Some people I know who are watching this have probably seen a lot of them, maybe even all of them. If that's you, for sure, definitely take advantage of calling that hotline. Okay, so ways that narcissists put stress on your body, and you're going to want to watch all the way till the end because there's something that I didn't know about. There's something really that everybody thinks that they know about but it's actually something that is not as common as you might think. Something that everybody thinks is super common and it's it's something that's different than everyone might think that I want to tell you all about at the end here. So the first one though is chronic fatigue and in issues on your adrenal system. You know, you're just so tired all the time. You don't even realize how tired you are. You know, it affects like your sleep, I mean, I know for me, when I was dealing with a narcissist all the time, I had a narcissistic business partner and my husband and I actually have a narcissist in our family that we had to draw some really pretty strict boundaries with until we even realized that I was waking up in the middle of the night thinking about it. I was thinking about it in the morning and during the day and, and brushing my teeth and all of this stuff. And it just, it takes all of your energy and you don't even realize what's going on. It really causes this massive amount of fatigue and stress on your body. And so you have this chronic fatigue going on and you don't even realize how tired you are until you start to recover from it. So that's number one. You just chronically fatigued and tired and you don't even realize why. That's the first one. Another way that narcissists put stress on your body, it really is actually stemming from the adrenal problems and the chronic fatigue is weight problems. Because what happens is when you have so much stress on your body, it actually starts to cause issues with your A1C levels and it slows down all kinds of other issues in your body, your metabolism and everything else. And so you actually start to develop weight problems, which actually causes all kinds of other issues in your body, not to mention problems on your joints, which in turn causes more problems with fatigue and more problems with your other systems and your other organs and everything else. And one contributes to the other. It's just an ongoing cycle with that because once you your systems all start slowing down then your your weight problems compound and then that actually causes more issues with everything else and then you're feeling worse about yourself and then you know especially if your narcissist is maybe even making you feel bad about how your weight problems you know are making you look or something like that it, it just even contributes worse, you feel bad about yourself, your self-esteem gets lower. It's just compounding, compounding, compounding. And so that leads me to number three, which is that you can start to have panic attacks, depression, and anxiety. You know, this is where it starts to affect your mental health. And now you really don't have the energy or the, the wherewithal to want to do anything about losing weight or you don't feel, you just feel lethargic and you don't want to do anything about getting out of bed or you don't have energy to want to get up and go exercise. You don't have the 
the joy or the lightness or this feeling in your body. I mean, vibrationally, your energy levels, I mean, you can actually measure in hertz how you're feeling and the lower level of emotions are actually lower vibrational as far as how you measure. So feelings such as sadness or anger or regret, you know, those lower level feelings are actually lower vibrational energies, feelings such as happiness and joy and contentment, they're much, much higher vibrational energy levels. And so it's interesting because you don't feel like doing anything and it all ends up compounding on itself. And so that takes its toll on your body because you just don't feel like doing anything. And then it gets worse and worse and worse, especially if this person is now continuing to degrade you or debase you or say things to you like you're worthless or you're good for nothing or no one loves you or I've talked to everybody in the neighborhood and everybody agrees with me that you're worthless or no one in your family even loves you, you know, and they say these things like that. And, you know, I have a whole video on the kinds of phrases that narcissists use, you know, narcissist favorite phrases, which you can definitely check out. You know, they say these things, by the way, because they don't feel good about themselves. They hate themselves. And, you know, you need to take care of yourself And you need to have self-care. And I have a whole video on self-care to cope with narcissists, which you should definitely check out. And so they lie to you. They say these things because they feel like crap about themselves and they hate themselves. And, you know, the way people treat other people is always a reflection of the way they feel about themselves. It has nothing to do with you and you can't take it personally. I know it's easier said than done, but it is the truth. So... These are just a few of the ways that narcissists put stress on your body. Another one is number four, chronic pain and digestive issues. You know, you can start to develop issues with autoimmune diseases, irritable bowel syndrome, fibromyalgia, lupus, all sorts of issues like that. I've heard many people talk about those kinds of things to me. And, you know, that's a a major problem, a major problem, you know, which is why you, you definitely need to start taking care of yourself, even if it's just breathing exercises, somatic exercises, you know, put your hand on your heart, put your hand on your stomach in the morning and say, I am healthy, I am loved, I am at peace you know, just start doing those kinds of things. Start at least a few times a day, stop and take some deep breaths. And when you're in stress, you don't realize that you start breathing in a much more shallow way. And then your cells are not getting oxygen to them. And so, you know, set your alarm a couple of times a day to go off and just take some deep breaths and breathe deeply a few times a day, just even that will make a huge difference for you. So I want you to put in the comments right now, breathe to remind yourself to breathe because just doing that, and I want you to do that right now, take a couple of deep breaths. And when you breathe in, just remind yourself to breathe in positive energy. And when you breathe out, Breathe out all of that negative energy that you are holding in. Imagine you're breathing in positive energy. And when you breathe out, you're just exhaling and you're getting rid of negative energy. And just doing that makes a huge difference. And number five, see PTSD. And I'm saying this because most people think of PTSD. And the difference, by the way, is PTSD is when you have been exposed to one set of events in a quick manner. So PTSD is, you know, like a car accident or a war or something, you know, one thing, a complex 
PTSD, so complex post-traumatic stress disorder, means that you have been exposed to something continuously over a long period of time, and it actually causes a much greater effect over time on your body. So it's complex post-traumatic stress disorder, and that is much, much worse for you. And that's what happens with people who have been in longer-term relationships with narcissists. And that's what I wanted to tell you about is number five and how narcissists put stress on your body. And that is why it is so important that you take care of yourself. That is why it is so important that you do look for an exit plan when it comes to narcissists. And that is why I do what I do. So they manipulate you. You know that they do. But did you know that there's like these little stealthy things that they do to manipulate you? And one of the things that they do, one of the little known manipulation tactics that they use is what I call faux apologies. It looks like they're, they're apologizing to you but they're not apologizing to you. They are actually using that as a manipulation strategy. They're actually saying, oh, I'm sorry, but it's really a way to future fake you, get you back into their web, get you back into their lair, get you to do what it is that they want you to do, or just to manipulate you back into their web of control. It's not really an apology. It's what I call a faux apology. It's a fake apology. It's definitely a manipulation strategy. Remember, everything they do is a manipulation. When they love bomb you, it's a manipulation. When they apologize to you, it's a manipulation. When they're nice to you, when they are not nice to you, everything they do is a manipulation. So that's number one. Number two is when they ghost you, when they just stop talking to you completely. You know, they've love bombed you. They've gotten you into their web of control. They've said they love you. You know, even if it's a business relationship and they said, oh my God, we're supposed to be, you know, working together. We're soulmates, you know, whatever it is. And then all of a sudden you don't hear from them. And then you're like, hey, what's going on? And, you know, we were supposed to be doing all this stuff. You're emailing like 50 times a day, and then suddenly you don't hear from them at all. That's a manipulation strategy. I have a whole video on if you've ever been ghosted or lied to, watch this. You're definitely going to want to check that out. Number three of the little-known manipulation strategies that narcissists use is guilt tripping. This is a big one that covert narcissists use. They guilt trip you, especially when they're like acting like, oh, you know, I wish you could have come. You know, it's really, you know, sad that you couldn't make it. That doesn't necessarily seem like a manipulation on the surface sometimes, you know, especially if it's like a family member or somebody that you love or supposed to love you. But it can be a manipulation. And, you know, it's sad to hear that sometimes, you know, but it, it really can be a manipulation, especially if, you know, they know that it's hard for you or if it's something that you really, it's, it's a difficult situation, it puts you in a precarious situation, but they're guilt tripping you into it anyway then that's definitely a narcissistic manipulation tactic. The next one is flattering you. You know, oh, you know, you, you're so good at this. You're so fantastic, that sort of thing. And they're really just manipulating you into doing something that they know that you don't want to do that you don't like, you know, or something to that effect, especially if, if it's really manipulating you into a situation that is maybe toxic for you or something to that effect. You know, that's really when they use flattery, you know, maybe it's using a combination of things, using flattery to 
guilt trip you into something. You know, it's flattery in and of itself may not necessarily be bad, of course. You know, who doesn't like to get compliments? But it's when they use it to manipulate you into something that's not necessarily something that you want to do or something that's definitely not good for you. So that's that's number four. And if you just had enough of their narcissistic manipulation, just put enough in the comments right now. Enough. It's just enough. It's time to stop. It's time to put a stop to it. It's just enough already. All right? So that's number four. So two more. Number five is one of my absolute things. It just absolutely gets under my skin. I just cannot take it. And this is changing the subject to evade accountability. This is one of the things that they just, it's like trying to catch a wave and pin it down. I actually have a whole TikTok video on this or, and you know, it's actually real on Instagram as well. And it's actually short, I think here on YouTube as well, where I actually did a whole little conversation on this where it's, it's really a form of gaslighting where you're trying to have a conversation with them and you're like, Hey, I want to talk to you about those text messages, you know, those suspicious text messages. And they're like, why are you trying to bring that up now? And well, when would be a good time? Oh, you're now you're raising your voice. Oh, I didn't raise my voice. Oh, now you're being just difficult. I, I wasn't being difficult. You know, it's like you can never get to the subject at hand because they're constantly changing the subject to evade accountability. That is a manipulation strategy. It's a manipulation tactic. All right. So that's number five. And number six is just absolutely going nuclear. They just out of nowhere go from zero to a hundred and you're like, what in the heck is going on? And they do that to create this massive fire over here so that you don't talk about what's going on over here. They just go bat, whatever you know, crazy, because then you aren't now talking about what's happening over here, right? It's now like this is the news instead of this being the news. All right, so let's talk about the coverts. You know, they're the ones that seem so nice to the rest of the world. I think they're the most dangerous ones because it's like these little teeny things. They're really under the radar that everybody else thinks they are wonderful. They're very good at having this plausible deniability they're very good at saying things and doing things in a way that can be shifted or taken in a way that, oh, I, that's not what I meant. I mean, it's, it's almost extremely hard to describe to other people. I mean, even recently, I was at an event. I was the keynote speaker for the event. And somebody was asking me about, oh, you had to deal with a covert narcissist. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. I said, yeah. And I said, I had to deal with one in business. Oh, really? What were some of the things that you had to deal with? And I said, oh, you know, I really have a hard time describing it because when I have to describe it, it never sounds all that bad because it's the things that they do are small and they mess with your mind and it's over time and it's very abusive over time and it's death by a, a thousand cuts and it's psychological. So I'm going to do these things and I want you guys to be writing things in the comments if you've seen these things, I, I really want to know. Okay. So here are a few. It's only because I care about you so much that I say this 
insert very underhanded put down statement about you. So here's an example, only because I care about you so much that I'm concerned about how much weight you're putting on or how much you're drinking or how much alcohol you're consuming or something like that, or how much of a slut you're going to look like with that red lipstick on, something like that. It's psychological a lot of times. Many times they say the statement to a third party, and sometimes they do this in advance of the discard to start seed planting so that when the discard actually happens, they've planted the seed so that they can show that third party that they were right. I'm so concerned about Susie. She's really drinking too much. She really had a lot to drink last night. I'm so concerned about her so that when the discard happens and the custody battle happens, Susie's an alcoholic. You see how that happens, but it's all under the guise of concern. And that's how the coverts come across through their, their very deep sense of care and concern. The other thing that they'll do, the other thing that they say is they'll say something that is very innocuous, that is ends up being a massive firestorm. I was in the presence of a covert narcissist who was with her stepdaughter. And she happened to say something about how she was with the, the husband, the father of the child, stepdaughter was in her 20s and she said oh i've been with your dad for 20 years whatever it was and the stepchild got very very upset because she realized that that meant that she had been with the father before the mother and father had broken up and was crying and upset and the covert narcissist was, oh, that was just a mistake. It wasn't my intention. I just said the year's wrong. It wasn't my intention to upset her. Uh, obviously, I just said the year's wrong. I meant these years. Clearly, it wasn't my intention to upset her. I meant this number of years, obviously. And she obviously knew the number of years, but she had that plausible deniability. It wasn't my intention to. So that's another thing that they say. It wasn't my intention to. They know exactly what they're doing, but they say things like that. And that's why it's, they're so difficult to pin down because Many times they seem so nice and so kind. And these are the people that are out there that they're humanitarians, they're doing things for the world. They're oftentimes clergy or doctors or, and people think, well, obviously it must have been a mistake. It was inadvertent, but you know that it's not. You know that it was absolutely not a mistake. Another thing that they do is they'll say, oh, I must have misunderstood. I said this wrongly, or I must have misunderstood. It's all gaslighting. It's meant to make you crazy, but it's not. Lots and lots of passive aggressive behavior. It's all very, very passive aggressive. Or they might say something like, oh, it must be so nice. It must be so nice to have it like this, something like that. And I do have much more on this in my video called The Covert Passive Aggressive Narcissist, which you are certainly welcome to check out because I had to deal with two of these in my life, one of which I've been able to cut out completely, thank God. The other one 
is a family member. So we put up very, very steel boundaries as much as we can. The other thing that they do is they'll do passive aggressive things like it's fine. It's fine. It's okay. Something like that. Another thing that they'll do is they'll make a comment and then they'll say, oh, I was just joking or they'll add ha to the, to the end of the statement. And you know that they weren't necessarily joking. By the way, if you have seen any of these things so far, give me an amen in the comments or I would love to know what some of the examples are that you guys have seen too. I'm sure you guys have seen many of your own as well. Another one that I've seen personally is they're extremely jealous. So if something good happens to you, they just can barely bring themselves to be happy for you. So they might say, well, congratulations. So good for you. And then when you say, aren't you happy for me? They'll say, yeah, I said, congratulations. And you say, well, you don't seem very happy. And you say your tone didn't seem very happy. And then they act like you're the one who's crazy. You're reading things into it. You are reading tone. They turn it and shift it onto you. Like you're the one who's absolutely insane. I said, I was really happy for you. I, I couldn't have said it even better. I, I warmly congratulated you, you know, so then you just don't even bother. And then you start, maybe you are crazy. Maybe you, then you, maybe you start to feel guilty. There's all of that as well, but you know, deep down inside that they really didn't seem all that happy for you. Or maybe they do seem jealous, something like that. The other thing that they are very, very good at is they're extremely skillful at saying kind of two things at once, at, at being able to kind of give a compliment and a put down all at once. It's kind of crazy how good they are at sort of saying something like your home, your brand new home is so beautiful. Oh, it's too bad. It's on the water where you're going to have so many issues with mosquitoes or wow, you've lost so much weight. It's too bad. You're going to have so much issue with a uh, sagging skin though, right? What, what a bummer about that. You know, something like that or or coded language. It's so great about your promotion, but what a bummer about the uh, amount of driving you're going to have to do, huh? I mean, just, I don't know. They, they're, they're very, very good. I'm not even <laughs> as good at even coming up with the examples as they are at, at it because they're so, so good at being able to kind of give you a compliment and also a put down at the same time and having that plausible deniability and, and saying things in a way that their target knows was a put down at the same time. They'll say something, you know, where they can actually say something to you and, oh, what was the name of that again? And that they, they know was, why wouldn't you remember that kind of a thing, which you know was meant to be a put down to you, or they'll bring a gift to you. And you know that that was meant to be a message to you and to the rest of the world. Oh, that was nice. They brought a gift. And to you, you know that that's a message. Those are the kinds of things that covert narcissists do and say they are the worst. As many of you know, they're the ones that I disdain and detest the most in a lot of ways. But it also means that there are definitely ways that you can handle them. I've given you lots and lots of ways that you can actually 
work with them in a very powerful way as far as negotiating with them as well. Definitely handle them. You can definitely negotiate with them in a powerful way. Let's talk about phrases that narcissists use to control you. There are a lot of different ones that they use, but the good news for you is that narcissists actually do use the same types of phrases that in all different sorts of situations. I mean, the one thing I I often say is that they're horrible, they're heinous, they're toxic, but it's almost like they use the same playbook. They are actually pretty predictable in their behavior. Are there different types of narcissists? Absolutely there are. There are covert narcissists, there are grandiose narcissists, there are malignant narcissists. And by the way, if you want to know more about covert narcissism in relationships, I do have a whole video on that. I do believe that covert narcissists are probably the most dangerous type of narcissist in a lot of ways because they're the most difficult to detect a lot of times. They're the stealthiest ones. They they look kind and sweet. And a lot of times they paint themselves as a victim. Sometimes there's like downtrodden. Oh, poor me. You know, they guilt trip people a lot of times. And so a lot of times the coverts are the most difficult ones to spot. And I actually, the two that I had to deal with that targeted me were both coverts. So going back to phrases that narcissists use to control you. One of them is no one else will love you the way that... I will, or no one else understands you the way that I do. No one else will deal with you. You know, basically try to make you feel like you're so disgusting, repulsive, horrible, whatever, in some way that you might as well not go anywhere else because they're the only ones who can, you know, manage you, handle you, like you, love you, whatever. But yet somehow they love you, they like you, they deal with you, they manage you. But, you know, you might as well stick with them because they do. But it's like kind of messed up because why do they stick with you and like you and love you or whatever? It kind of defies logic, but yet that is something that they often will say, you know? So it's it's sort of like to get you to stay because if you go anywhere else, you're going to be rejected. You'll be alone. You'll be isolated. So you might as well stick with this person who's basically mentally, psychologically, and and spiritually abusing you. So that's number one. Number two is they talk in absolutes. Everyone else thinks this, or no one else thinks that. Like basically to try to get you to believe that whatever it is that you think is just stupid, dumb, ridiculous, not based in reality. If you're trying to make a point to them about something that you think, usually about something about them, they'll try to use this collective, who the hell knows who, you don't even know who everyone else is, or no one else is, but these you know, nebulous whoever's don't agree with you. They all agree with the narcissist, whoever these people are. But it's it's meant to try to make you feel bad. It's meant to try to make you feel like your opinion is completely discredited, invalidated, means nothing. And therefore, you shouldn't have it because, you know, whoever their flying monkeys are, they all are lined up with them 
and against you. So that's another kind of phrase that narcissists use to control you. Another type of phrase that narcissists use to control you and there are going to be several of these. We're going to go into the types of phrases that narcissists use within the gaslighting realm. By the way, I do have a whole video on how to shut down gaslighting, which you should definitely check out as well. But so these are the types of phrases that narcissists will use to make you think that you're crazy because gaslighting is meant to make you think that you're crazy. It's meant to make you feel like whatever it is that you're thinking isn't true, to make you question your mind, to make you question your reality, to make you question what it is that you believe that you saw or you heard or what you're seeing isn't what you're seeing or what you're hearing isn't what you're hearing or what the conversation is that you believe took place isn't what you took place. Your feelings aren't your feelings. That's what gaslighting is. So they will say things in the gaslighting realm such as you're oversensitive. So you're oversensitive is to invalidate your feelings. So if you are feeling hurt about something that took place, then they'll say you're oversensitive. You shouldn't be hurt about that. That's meant to invalidate your feelings. Another gaslighting phrase is something like, we talked about that and this is what we agreed to. You agreed to this, don't you remember? And you'll be like, we didn't agree to that. We never had that conversation. We agreed to this or that conversation that never took place at all. They will change the details of a conversation or they'll basically say that you agreed to something that never took place whatsoever. That's total gaslighting. You'll say, you said this, and they'll say, I never said that. I never said that at all. Again, that's gaslighting. They'll say things like you're delusional when you're trying to say something about how something took place or how you're, you're feeling about something or your perception of something that's happening. You're delusional. I mean, that's totally meant to just say you're crazy. I mean, that's straight up gaslighting straight up gaslighting. You know, if you see a text message between somebody and a coworker, you know, maybe it's your husband and a coworker that looks flirtatious or something, and you know, it doesn't look totally appropriate. You're just jealous. And it turns out maybe you weren't just jealous. Maybe there was something going on between them. That's all gaslighting. Those are all gaslighting types of phrases. You know, they're designed to make you think that you're crazy. Another type of gaslighting is in conversation where you're trying to have a conversation with them and you'll say, I want to talk to you about, you know, these text messages that I saw. And they'll say, why are you bringing that up now? And you say, well, when would be a good time? And they'll say, well, Oh, I don't, I don't like your tone. Well, I, I didn't raise my voice. Yes, you did. You just raised your voice. And now, I, now I can't talk to you because you're raising your voice at me. And, 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 and now you, you can't get to the point of it because they keep interrupting you about that. Oh, now you just interrupted me. Oh, now it's about this. Oh, now it's about that. And you can never get to the actual point of the conversation because they keep talking about other things and it, you know they'll bring up something else or they'll bring up something else or they'll bring up something else again you know project deflect lie deny if you've seen any of this so far i would love to see a totally in the comments because i'm sure that you guys have seen some of this so far okay and then the next kinds of phrases that narcissists will use to control you are what I call guilt trip phrases, guilt trip phrases. And you will definitely see this with covert narcissists. This is so much, you know, because of the victim mentality with covert narcissists. I mean, this is the one thing that you always see with covert narcissists. And I have a whole video on 
the one thing you always see with covert narcissists, you should definitely check it out. So guilt trip phrases. This is like, especially if you try to leave a covert narcissist, you try to leave a narcissist, you know, they might try to say things like, I would die if you leave or don't leave the family. I would commit suicide if you leave or you can't leave the family. Oh, I can't believe you're spending time over there. I can't believe you wouldn't be with the family. And so they'll try to guilt trip you, you know, so that you don't do the kinds of things that you want to do. They'll try to make you feel bad. So let's talk about what coercive control is when it comes to narcissism. The thing that you have to do is understand where it comes from before we can even really understand what coercive control is and why they do it. So narcissists have no inner sense of value. Something happened with them when they were back in their childhood and they, 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 they came to a conclusion that the world is a bad place. They came to a conclusion that that they have no sense of value, that there's something maybe innately wrong with them or something in it, in, innately broken. And, and it could have been anything. It could have been a trauma that happened to them. It could have been abuse that happened to them. Um, I've even read some things that have said that children who are overindulged too much, they feel like their parents didn't care enough about them to uh, discipline them, to give them boundaries. You know, children need boundaries. They need guidelines. They need structure to feel uh, secure. And, and without that, they sometimes end up feeling like they have no inner sense of value. So who knows how it happened, but what happened is that at some point, they drew the conclusion that they didn't have value to them. So they ended up um, feeling like they needed to get value from the outside world in some way. So they're trying to layer it on, they kind of slather it on this narcissistic supply, but underneath, you know, it's still a feeling of emptiness, of worthlessness and all of that. And no empaths, you can't fix it. You can't make them better. They just end up sucking you into their poisonous vortex and you just end up trying to get out. When people are, are, are leaving a narcissist, they don't just walk away nicely. You know, they, they, they run with their hair on fire trying to get away from these people because it's terrible. So you can't fix them, but they have this sense of em emptiness inside of them. And so they draw this conclusion that they need to take control of the world by, you know, controlling everything around it. Um, because without that sense of control, they feel like they're not being seen. They feel like they don't exist in the world. So coercive control is actually a form of narcissistic supply. And that supply is anything that feeds that narcissist ego. So it could be, you know, anything that feeds a narcissist ego. It could be money compliments or, you know, prestige or whatever. But most of the time, what you see with narcissists is where they are actually trying to control a person or they're devaluing them or they're manipulating them or intimidating, you know, all of those kinds of sort of the dark side of narcissism. Those are the kinds of things that you often see with narcissists. And if you've seen that dark side of a narcissist, give me an I've seen it in the comments. So when a narcissist feels insecure, which is all the time, they try to exert control over other people in order to kind of control their environment. So they, 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 it's, it's a type of control that they put over a person that ends up manifesting itself in all sorts of ways. You know, they actually start to, you know, maybe want to know where you are at all times. Maybe they look at your phone, 
Maybe they control how you dress, what you wear, who you see, when you see them. Um, what kind of car you drive, when you drive your car. I actually saw a situation one time where the husband would actually, you know, check the mileage on the car before he would leave for work and see, you know, if the wife drove anywhere at the end of the day. And if she did, where did she go? Um, you know, they might put car trackers on you. They might uh, track your phone. They might have some sort of software that tracks what your emails are, what your text messaging is, things like that. I mean, it, it can get really, really uh, malignant and poisonous where they're looking to control every aspect of your life, what you think, what you say, how you breathe, almost everything. And, and, and then while they're doing this, they're probably devaluing you and treating you poorly. Also while they're love bombing you and all the other things, but, um, it, it's a form of, of controlling you that can go really, really deep and really, really far. But what they're trying to do is, um, make sure that all of your world is about them every single thing. I mean, they might even be like, if you look at, uh, uh, happen to, you know, inadvertently look up and see a person, they might say, oh, you want that person. You know, they don't even want you looking at other people. They don't want you talking to other people. Sometimes it can get really, really, um, um, advanced like that. So it's, uh, it can be kind of scary sometimes when, when they get really deep into this type of coercive control, but it's a form of narcissistic supply. It gives them supply to know that they have control. It feeds their ego. And, um, and if you want to know more about narcissistic supply, check out my video on narcissistic supply. It goes much deeper into what you need to know about narcissistic supply. In a divorce setting, how I see coercive control manifesting itself is when somebody chooses a lawyer and they really don't want you to have a lawyer because that now this is another person who might exert control over you, another person who you might listen to, another person who's going to be advising you, and you might be taking that person's opinion or advice over theirs, which of course you should definitely be listening to your lawyer if you have one. So, but what they'll start to do in this particular situation is they'll start to try to devalue your lawyer to you. So, you know, they'll come up to you and they'll say, you know, um, your lawyer is a bad lawyer or your lawyer is too busy or your lawyer, um, is just in it for the money or, um, you know, they just start to, to bad mouth your lawyer in some way because they're, they're realizing that they're losing control over you. And if you want to know more about what happens when a narcissist is starting to lose control or what the signs are, make sure you check out my video on signs that a narcissist is losing control. But in a divorce setting, you know, they'll, anybody who's going to start to try to have control over you or that they perceived is going to have now control over you instead of them is going to become the enemy. So they're going to start targeting those people so that you stay into their web of control, even as you're, you know, on the, the way out, e even if they are divorcing you, even if they're the ones leaving you, you start to see that happening. Let's talk about what's going on with narcissistic hoovering and those five signs of hoovering. So what is hoovering anyway? So hoovering is it, it, either you've already gone into the discard phase of the narcissistic relationship, which is kind of like the end of a narcissistic relationship, or sometimes, you know, the discard can be starting like long, long before you're actually discarded or you're, you've discarded them. But you, you're into this phase of the relationship and yet here they come back again. Here they, you know, it may be like, it's been a year since you've heard from this person and out of the blue, you get a text from this person. And, you know, it may look like an attempt at reconciliation or it may look like an attempt at actually valuing you again or, 
or maybe they're finally seeing you for who you are. Maybe they're finally, uh, you know, uh, appreciating all of the things that you did for them. But it's really what it is, is a manipulation tactic. It's a way to get supply from you. Uh, again, it's a way to, um, it, it's, a, it's a very toxic way of getting you back under their web of control. So the first one is that they reach out because they are in a time of crisis. Oh my gosh, uh, my father-in-law is sick or my best friend um, is in the hospital or I, I just you know, had a, a health scare, something like that where now all of a the sudden they're in crisis and so you have to come back and you have to feel sorry for them. You know, for some reason there's something going on with them that has put them into victim mode again. Maybe it's a financial crisis, uh, you know, and they, and you are the only one who can help them. You're the only one who they can talk to, who that they can go to. And this is after they've treated you terribly, were horrible to you, you know, weren't there for you ever. And now all of a sudden, you know, you're the only one who can help them. And, and they're in massive crisis mode, meltdown mode, and you've got to go running and be there for them. And you're supposed to just set aside any bad blood that ever took place, or you're supposed to just forgive anything that they may have done to you because, you know, my gosh, don't you have a heart? You know, they're, they're in crisis. Don't think about any of that right now. Just be there for them. I mean, don't you have a heart? You, you, you have to come back and be there for me. So that's just one of the signs that maybe you are being hoovered. Another sign that you're being hoovered is that they're declaring their undying love for you or they're apologizing emphatically. So this is where, you know, you've said, okay, enough already. That's it. I'm done. You know, maybe, maybe they've broken it off with you and you were like, okay with it. But regardless, you know, they, they start seeing that their supply source is actually walking out the door. So now all of a sudden, oh my gosh, I love you so much. I can't live without you. I am so sorry. I will do whatever I need to. I will change for you. And this is where you might start seeing the narcissist faux apology, which is they say sorry just because they need to. Uh, and if you want to know more about the narcissist faux apology, you can check out more about that in my video called Do Narcissists Ever Say Sorry? Uh, you know, and of course they do say sorry sometimes. And you see this more from the covert narcissist, not as much the malignant narcissist or the other types of nar narcissists, but covert narcissists are the more smart, cunning ones. They're much better at covering up their narcissism. They're much better at looking like uh, they are so perfect to the world, except to the person that they have targeted and who have been their victims. I know because the couple of narcissists that I had to deal with in my own life were both covert narcissists. And if you want to know more about covert narcissists, check out my video on the covert passive aggressive narcissist. It, they are insidious and um, very stealth, very under the radar. And so these are the ones that you're going to see say it coming back and saying, oh my gosh, I am so sorry. I never should have acted that way. You had every reason to be upset and on and on and on. But then of course, once they apologize and they get you back into their web of control and you're back where they want you to be, then whatever it is that they promised, whatever they, it is that they said they weren't going to do or were going to do, that just flies right out the window and you're supposed to forget about that. And then when you bring it up, now you're just uh, being difficult, you are being um, disrespectful, you're just bringing up the past, you're just trying to make it um, 
you know, br bring up stuff and, and, and be overly uh, toxic toward them when all you were doing was saying, hey, how come you didn't fulfill your promise to begin with? I mean, it's so messed up with that. But th that's another sign which is of hoovering, which is that you start seeing, um, you know, them running back to you, declaring undying love, and maybe even apologizing. So the third thing that you'll see is these random texts, these random gifts. And, the, you know, these can happen, uh, you know, I was talking about this a little bit in the introduction to this video, but these can happen like even long after you've no longer been in contact with them. Suddenly, out of the blue, you get a text message like, oh, watching our favorite movie, thinking of you, or something like that, or I just had our favorite dinner, wish you were here, you would have loved it, or maybe out of the blue, you'll get a, a birthday gift, something just shows up at your door and, and you, suddenly your heart stops. You think, oh my God, I know um, I was hearing a lot of stories about this at the beginning of COVID where people who thought that they had finally gotten that narcissist out of their lives, now suddenly a basket shows up at their house thinking of you, here's masks and, um, and hand sanitizer and uh, you know, something like that. Like, and, and this is the kind of thing that narcissists are so good at because if you go to tell somebody in the outside world, hey, this person just left a basket at my door and they're like, oh, what, what was it? Was it a, a dead rabbit? Oh no, it was hand sanitizer and face masks and, you know, and, and you think, well, What's wrong with that? That sounds pretty nice. But you know, as the person who has dealt with narcissism, and I know this is something that I had to deal with, it's like, that's not what it's supposed to be meaning. It's supposed to be a, like a warning sign almost to you, or it's, a, it's a, a way to suck you back in into their web of control and becoming that source of supply to them again. And so like this chill goes through your body and you think, oh my God, I definitely do not want to hear from this person ever again. I definitely don't want this stuff from you, please just go away. Please just get out, get away from me. Um, or, or sometimes it, it's like cruel in a way because it took you so long to get over this person and it took you so long to finally not be thinking about them anymore. And then boom, there they are showing up again, showing up in, in your text messages or showing up through an email or something like that. And, and that is another form of hoovering. And if you have seen this, or if you've been a victim of hoovering, give me an OMG yes in the comments. And the next way that you know that you're being a victim of hoovering, or that you've been a victim of hoovering, is that you start seeing them showing up in random places. So, you know, all of a sudden, there they are at the grocery store that you always shop at, or you start seeing them at the gym that you go to or at the yoga studio that you go to. And it's like so random, but not random. Like, oh, uh, there you are. I didn't know that you shopped over here. You live on the other side of town. I remember that that actually happened to my husband by his ex-girlfriend like 20 something years ago, back when we were first starting to date. And his ex-girlfriend would just be like showing up at the most crazy random places, like where he would be studying for the bar and she would show up at this library that he randomly decided to go to that wasn't even near either of their houses. Like, oh, hi, I just happened to be here. You know, something like that. and. Um, again, like that chill goes through your body, like, oh my God, there they are again. Um, or the other thing, the other way that they start randomly showing up is that they start becoming friends with your friends or friends with your acquaintances. This is something that 
uh, one of the narcissists in my life uh, also did was uh, when, uh, this was an extended family member, so when my husband and I decided that we no longer wanted to have contact with this person or tried to, to, tried to minimize the contact and, and, and have very strict boundaries, now this person was starting to, uh, you know, suck up to other people in our lives and suddenly become friends with people in our world so that this person would be able to kind of like spy on us and, and also sort of like try to show us how wonderful this person was or, or that we are so wrong because look at, see the rest of the world sees how wonderful this person is. So that's another way of demonstrating hoovering. And the last sign of hoovering is probably the scariest sign. And this is where you're gonna see a lot more about you know, you'll see this much more from like malignant narcissists. The malignant narcissist and some of the more, you know, pathologically um, mentally ill narcissists will start stalking you. And that, they, I mean, yes, showing up randomly at the grocery store and saying hello is one thing, but really stalking you and really, you know, doing things that they know are not where they're not going to get caught, but you know that it's from them. So things start showing up in your mail. Um, maybe you're getting phone calls or emails from random numbers, random places. Um, you know, I've seen uh, clients where their exes, you know, knew a lot about cyber it, you know, information, and they were able to create random emails that came from random IP addresses. And so, but, you know, and they would leave these messages, but it was really, really hard to trace um, these emails or really hard to trace these texts, things like that, where you just start to be really scared for your life and concerned for what this person may or may not do to you. And in addition to the stalking, what you might also see is like a gaslighting move, which is really kind of like a sixth thing, which is like, um, oh, this, this discard never happened. Uh, we didn't uh, agree to break up. We didn't agree to no longer be in each other's lives. Um, one of the like more bizarre things that I've seen with narcissists is that you've had this horrible breakup and then they come back and they um, start making comments on your social media or other people's social, so, social media where um, something's been posted about you and they say, oh, you know, this is so great and you're so wonderful. And they just act like that thing that happened between you or the, the long history of things that happened to you never happens. So it's kind of like a gaslighting of the discard phase. So those are all the different signs of hoovering. Um, it can be really confusing, especially if you're, you're working so hard to get over that trauma bonding. And if you want to know more about trauma bonding, check out my video on trauma bonding. But you've tried so hard to get this person out of your brain waves and out of your neuronal patterns and trying to move on. And you've gotten so far down the path and you're finally making progress and you're finally getting to a point where you're getting on with your life and then here they come again and they do that because there's still some supply to potentially be sucked out of you so they come back and remember even seeing you squirm seeing you upset seeing you um uh you know angry emotional they get supply from that too so regardless of uh, you know, even if it's not just thinking that they're wonderful, they do get supply from seeing you upset. So if there's any amount of supply to be had still, here they come hoovering back into your life again. Fake being empathetic? All right, let's dive in. One way is that they watch others and then they guess on how to behave based on that they kind of just watch. They sort of mirror that. And especially in the love bombing phase, by the way, and 
I do have a whole video on how narcissists mirror you, which is sort of weird on that. And but they they do they they watch you, and especially in the love bombing phase, they want to just sort of match you and mirror you and see what you're doing. And covert narcissists are really really good at this. And looking to see how others behave and just do exactly that. And by the way, this is a, a way that you can tell that narcissists know that their behavior is wrong because they know how to look good, right? They know how to look like they're behaving correctly. So they watch others and behave based on that. That's number one. And number two is closely related, but it's not just the behavior. It's they learn what to say based on listening to what others have said in certain situations. And this is especially true in situations where, oh, you know, I'm so sorry to hear what's been happening with you you know, since your mom has been sick, or I'm so sorry to hear that your dog has cancer, or I'm sorry to hear what's going on in your family, or whatever. I mean, they know the things to say, especially if, you know, if they think it's going to get them somewhere, or, you know, if they are trying to get you to lure you into their web into their lair, especially early on in the situation, you know, whether it's a business situation or a personal situation, whether they're trying to get you into the next phase as quickly as possible. And I do have a whole video on love bombing. If you want to know more about that, you can definitely check that out as well. And number three is they will act as if they care if it serves them to manipulate the situation. And, you know, I've seen this, especially, you know, if somebody has cancer, for example, you know, they run to the side of the person who has cancer, especially if it, it looks like, you know, they can be this, become the center of attention for themselves, like, because everybody's paying attention to that particular person. And so they can be sitting at the hospital bed and basically be the person who's getting attention sitting next to that person. It's really, really gross. It's really, really manipulative. And, you know, I've seen it where they end up actually, you know, putting themselves in the situation of trying to almost be, you know, like Munchausen's by proxy, by the way, is an extension of this. And, you know, the where the parent actually makes their child sick. And that's exactly what this is, which is so sick. I mean, no, no pun intended. And if you think it's so sick, put it so sick in the comments. Really, really gross. Really, really awful but that's what they do. The next one is, you know, they'll use tears or emotions like that to make themselves out to be the victim if they need to, or guilt. They try to become the victim, and then, like, that makes them appear more empathetic that way. Like, oh, I, you know, they're so caring, crying about other victims because they're just absolutely crying about victims of, I don't know, an earthquake or a hurricane and almost like so empathetic about other victims that they're crying and, and empathetic and feeling guilty almost about these victims themselves manipulating people in that way. Sometimes they really do care, but sometimes it's it's also part of a game or a manipulation as well. So, and you have to look to see what their real motivation is. I mean, it's it's like, what is the motivation behind it? What is the intent behind it, right? And number five is 
putting themselves in empathetic roles or careers to come across more caring. You know, sometimes you, you see, you know, people who really do care and obviously, you know, this is not an attack on people who actually do care. But there are times that people put themselves in roles of like a priest or a preacher or something like that to make it appear that they're caring. And then they use that position to manipulate people or do really bad things because they want to appear like they're empathetic. And then they use that position to do things that are not good. And so they fake being empathetic and they use that role to do things that are really horrible to people. So these are some of the ways that narcissists can fake being empathetic to people. And I have seen it, especially with coverts. This is really a methodology of a covert narcissist, even more so than I think grandiose narcissists, especially, you know, where they put themselves in roles, especially like careers, where they look like they're empathetic. And I've also seen this in members of my own family sometimes, where they use people's heartstrings, sicknesses, things like that as an opportunity for themselves to get attention. It's really awful when you see it happen, but that's what they do sometimes. All right. So let's talk about what's going on when you're dealing with narcissists. I mean, most of the time they are making you lose your mind, right? I mean, they love it. They thrive on it. It gives them narcissistic supply, which is their lifeblood, their food, their oxygen, what they live on. They live for that. They literally get off on trying to make you lose your mind. And so how can you possibly turn it around against them? Well, one of the things you need to remember is that you got to think about who it is that you're dealing with over here. I mean, this is a person who has no inner sense of value. They get suck all of their value from the external world. And most of the time that value is going to come from either adulation or compliments or doing things for them, or they're going to turn around and get it from you in the form of, you know, devaluing you, putting you down, making you feel bad, trying to control you, all of those kinds of things, they get supply from that as well. So it's going to be one or the other, but the only reason why you're in their space that they even give you the time of day is because you are giving them some source of supply. That's why they want to keep you around. So knowing that, remember that you hold all the cards. You're the one who is giving them that supply source. It's like the oxygen that we need to breathe really has all the leverage over us because we need it to breathe. And so, you know, you kind of forget sometimes that you are actually that oxygen to the narcissist. So it's pretty easy to make them go crazy and drive them absolutely nuts if you think about it in terms of what supply is it that you are giving to them. So the object of this whole game here is for you to figure out a way to no longer be a good host, a good source of supply, a good source of, of nutrition for them, all right? Because they're going to have to then go slither on down the road and go look for it somewhere else. Remember that they want to feel, you know, powerful. So they're doing whatever they can to make sure that you see them as being powerful. So one of the ways that you can completely make them go crazy is to stop giving them adulation. Stop giving them, oh, you're so wonderful. You're so great. You know, that sort of thing. Now I will tell you one of the ways that I do tell you to kind of get what you want from a narcissist is to sparingly use this adulation, sparingly use their need 
for being complimented to get them to do some things that you want them to do. And I call that bartering. So, um, you know, you can use it to ethically manipulate the manipulator sometimes. But number one is to just stop giving them that adulation. They will absolutely go crazy if you do that. Number two is to stop doing the things that you're doing that are giving them narcissistic supply. So if you are in business with a narcissist, for example, I've talked to people who are business partners with narcissists and they end up doing all of the work. They end up basically doing like 95% of everything. And then the narcissist sits around and tries to take all the credit and, and you know, you're making them look good, right? So if you take away that and you stop doing those things for them, that'll make them go bananas. And another thing that you can do is like stop being at their beck and call, stop being that supply source for them. So that's, that's number two, which is just stop doing any of the things that are giving them narcissistic supply. If you want to know more about what supply is specifically, I do have a video specifically that just explains all about narcissistic supply. So I definitely recommend that you check that out. Okay, so there are a million other ways that you can torture them, but let's just go through at least two more. One of them is pointing out their insecurities and flaws. Like you don't wanna have to do that, but if you kind of point out their little flaws and you kind of give them a little bit of a taste of their own medicine, they cannot stand it. Any perceived slight, they absolutely go crazy. And if they think that you're even talking to them with some kind of a tone, I always say they hear tones like dogs hear whistles. They cannot stand it. They don't want a taste of their own medicine. They like to dish it out, but they definitely cannot take it. So that's definitely um, number three is pointing out any kind of flaw or insecurity or issue that there may be with them. And, you know, if you are like so ready to torture them and give them a taste of their own medicine, give me a torture them in the comments below. All right. So next and last for this video is definitely one of the easiest and best ways for you to mess with them, but it's in the long run, so much better for you is to remove yourself from their lives. Just basically, you're not in this game anymore. You're not playing. You know, they can play by themselves from now on or go find somebody else to play this game with, but you're not in it anymore. And it, it will definitely especially drive them absolutely crazy if they didn't see it coming. But I do recommend if you are in a romantic type of a relationship with a narcissist to make sure you have a plan. Don't let them know ahead of time. Definitely have a plan. Know where you're going to be. Know how you're going to get there. Know how much money you're going to need when you're there. You know, if you have children together, make sure that you have some kind of a parenting plan in place. Make sure that it's in writing. All of those kinds of things. And until you get to that point, when you're ready to pull the, the trigger on making that happen, you will want to do everything you can to make them believe that everything is copacetic, business as usual. Don't let on what's going on. Don't give them a heads up. Don't try to talk to them about it because they're, they're seeing this loss of supply that's going to be walking out the door and they're going to do whatever they can to shut that down and make sure that you aren't able to get out. So don't give them a heads up on it. Just do what you need to do. And then when you walk out, do not look back. And if it's in a business relationship, do the same thing. I've had to do it myself. I've had to wipe people from the CPU of my life so that it's like they didn't even ever exist. That is the best way to be free. You know, there's always going to be toxic people coming in and out of your life. You just have to learn how to be okay with that and let them go. Don't look for revenge, by the way. I had a conversation with somebody recently where they just wanted to look for revenge and they really believed that that was what was going to help them get over their trauma was getting revenge on this person. 
And I told her that the only way she's really going to get revenge is to take that supply source away from the narcissist, put it aside, let it go, move on, break free. Don't worry about hurting the narcissist. That'll get taken care of in some way, one way or another, but you don't need to worry about that yourself. 